Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the gift of the Sabbath and the privilege we have of gathering together to socialize and learn more of you and strengthen our connection to you. We ask you to bless each person here. You know the journey that they are on, the struggles that they have. Guide them, give them hope and courage as they face what this world has. We look forward to that wonderful day when we will be with you permanently. Amen. You may be seated. Welcome to the Loma Linda University Sabbath School. We are so thankful to see each one of you here, all of you here in the sanctuary, and those who are joining us through some other means. Welcome to our Sabbath School here in Loma Linda. My name is Lolita Campbell, and I'm an educator, and I'm going to introduce all the people who are participating in the program today. Our chorister is Marina Williams, and we've listened to her lovely voice many times. She's also an educator and a choir member. We're grateful for what she does for us. Our organist, Donna Sampson, who is a lover of music, and she shares her talents on that organ with us on a regular basis, and we're blessed by that. Our special music today is brought to us by Adino Biaghi and Brianna Clemens. We will be blessed with their beautiful music. I look forward to hearing what they are going to share with us. We have a very special presentation today. Rodney Vance, who is the chair of the film and television department at La Sierra University, will be sharing. He started his career as a pastor and a chaplain after he graduated from the seminary at Andrews University. He is now a member of the Writers Guild of America. He's a member of the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, and he loves making movies. Our Sabbath School lesson is brought to us by Calvin Thompson, who's on the faculty here at Loma Linda University. And if you remember, he is a lover of photography, nature photography. I've seen some of his photos on Facebook, and they're, they're wonderful. Thank you for sharing. I have a poem to share with you today. The author is unknown. I found it online, and it's listed as unknown by the, by the author, but it's called Pass It On. If you hear a kind word spoken of some worthy soul you know, it may fill his heart with sunshine if you'd only tell him so. If a deed, however humble, helps you on your way to go, seek the one whose hand has helped you. Seek him out and tell him so. If your heart is touched and tender, towards sinner lost and low, it might help him to do better, if you could only tell him so. Oh, my sisters, oh, my brothers, as o'er life's rough path you go, if God's love has saved and kept you, do not fail to tell men so. May we follow in Jesus' footsteps and be the kind of person we would like to be around. Everybody likes a good story. Everybody likes a good story because it entertains us. It makes us care about whoever the story is about for at least a little while, more than we care about ourselves and our own troubles, so it helps us escape a little bit. <clears throat> Stories, especially visual storytelling, have become the universal language in the world today. YouTube, whatever's happening online, movies, television, Netflix. More people speak story than any other single language in the world, so it's important to pay attention to it. Stories are also important for a couple of very key reasons. First of all, stories teach us 
how we grow and change. They take us through that process and they prepare us for it. English teachers have told us for decades that stories have a beginning, middle, and an end. Have you ever wondered why stories have a beginning, middle, and an end? What is it about stories that makes that particular structure so important? I'll tell you what it is. It's because that's how we change as human beings. Say you want to quit smoking. Let's pick a habit. You, are, you start out as a smoker. Something happens. You see uh, a picture of somebody, a cancered lung or something, and you decide, you know, maybe I ought to quit this, but you don't quit quite yet. You're not quite ready to. You can think of all the reasons why you shouldn't quit. If you quit, you're going to gain weight. If you quit, you won't have a way to relax and de-stress and all of that stuff. But then maybe a friend dies of lung cancer or some other disease. And you decide, I'm going to quit smoking. In a story, in story terms, you have just shifted from the beginning of your story to the middle. The beginning is where you figure out what the problem is that you want to solve. The middle is where you decide to solve it. And you try to quit. And it's not easy. A lot of obstacles stand in the way. You might fail. In fact, storytelling teaches us that you will fail before ultimately you decide, I am going to beat this thing no matter what. You've gone into the end. You and that cigarette battle it out. You either quit smoking or you don't. And you've reached the end of your story. Change has either happened or it hasn't. If it's a happy ending, you grew. If it's an unhappy ending, you have to live with things the way they are. Stories teach us how we change and grow. They make us comfortable with it. That's why children love stories so much. And we tell them stories. We tell them stories to warn them about dangers in the world. But most importantly, we tell them stories so that they are comfortable with the constant growth that children are in the constant change that they experience. Stories are also important because they teach us who we are. The story of Loma Linda University, there are stories. How the university got started, what the medical school was like at the very beginning. These stories make this institution what it is. These stories make this church what it is. Our national stories make the United States of America what it is. We have our own stories that are different than the stories of Germany or the stories of Argentina. They have their stories. We are who we are because of the stories that we tell ourselves, the stories that we remember. We are who we are as a family because of our stories. This is true even if with an adopted child. If a child is adopted at a very early age, the story becomes stronger than blood in terms of making us part of a family. How did mom and dad meet? What did I do when I was little? Tell me again about the time I swallowed a quarter. And what happened? Those are the stories that make us a family. So stories entertain us. They make us realize, at least for a brief time, that the concerns and problems of the hero of the story are more important than our own for a brief period of time. How many other things do that? How many other times are there in our lives when we are more concerned about what another person is going through than we are about what we are going through for a couple of hours. Not very often when you really stop and think about it. Stories take us out of ourselves. They take us through the process of change and they teach us who we are. So one of the things that stories can do for us is teach us how we can change the world that we live in. Because when we change our story, we change our world. This can be profound. Sometimes, if mental illness is not the issue, changing our story can save our lives 
by taking us out of a kind of despair that leads us towards suicide and leads us to a place of hope, is changing what's going on in the story that's in our head that makes that change. So when we lose our stories, the stories even that we tell ourselves in our own head, we lose ourselves, we lose our world, we lose our identity. And two film students from La Sierra University made a film that is about exactly that. It's called The Chocolate Shop, and I invite you to watch it right now. Isn't life like a box of chocolate? I'm sorry? Or at least that's what I've been told. I'm sorry. I think I'm a bit lost. This place seems very familiar to me. It's familiar to a lot of people. My wife always said that it was taste and smell that helps people remember. This place helps people remember? Only if you want it to. How? Let me show you. Don't you want to remember? I met my wife at the park. That's her favorite. First time we kissed, her dad happened to catch us. Guess I wasn't the right shade of chocolate. This one I made myself. Made? Making chocolate with my specialty. Go ahead, take one. getting married. Louis? What's wrong? There is one more need to try. You're my granddaughter. 
Where's Anne? Where's your mom? She stepped out for a bit. But Grandma, what are you doing here? Where's the nurse? Oh, you worry too much. I was just eating chocolate with your... and she must have gotten out of the car while I went into the store. Grandma? I'm sorry. Do I know you? Come on, Miss Sarah. I'll take you home. Tell your mother I'll call her later. And that's another thing stories do, they touch our heart. When we lose our stories, we lose who we are. I'd like to introduce you to Ian Walker, the director of the film, and Vester Banner, who wrote the film. So gentlemen, why this story? Why did you want to tell this particular story? It was for several different reasons. Uh, my mother uh, is a huge fan of the Hallmark Channel, and I thought that maybe this could be <laughs> like a Hallmark movie. Um, and then my uh, great aunt, uh, she also suffered from Alzheimer's disease, and so I thought I wanted to make something, you know, in dedication of her and this disease. And who doesn't like chocolate? So that was my <laughs> third reason for getting involved with this film. Uh, for me, um it spoke to me because I don't necessarily know anyone with Alzheimer's, but I know people who do know, um, have like relatives that have Alzheimer's and suffer from that. And so I kind of thought it would be nice to, you know, make this for them. And then um, at the same time, thinking something as simple as chocolate that can help, you know, bring back all these memories for someone uh, really like spoke to me. So that's why I got involved in it. Ian, you're the director of the film. Vester, you're the writer. Tell me a little bit about the writer-director relationship and how that worked for you on uh, the making of this film. Uh, well, this is actually, this was our second film that we had actually worked on. Uh, but this one in particular, this one came with some, some growing pains and uh, <laughs> some tribulations and trials. Uh, it was just the fact that even itself, it, yeah, even itself trying to get in this film into production was in a story in itself because we almost didn't go to production. Uh, we had run into so many different, you know, host of issues and problems, and we were just like, should we even do this film right now, or should we just backtrack and wait? But, you know, just the collaboration between me and Ian, we put our heads together, and we were able to come up with a, you know, a beautiful story that was just in time for enough for, like, film festivals and everything. Uh, yeah, just like you said, it had its ups and downs, but we got there, and um, it's... He had already had the story written when he approached me to uh, make it. And it's nice having someone um, who's a writer who like takes suggestions and things like that and doesn't you know, get upset for 
changing the story at all, but it, it's a good uh, relationship here. All right, good. If we had more time, I'd be explore some of those ups and downs and get a little bit more specific, but in the lot, meantime, we'll, we'll leave it as is. How's that? Um, both of you were students at La Sierra Film um, when, uh, and La Sierra University when this was made. Uh, tell me a little bit about how that um, contributed to um, the making of this film or just telling stories, your education. Oh, well, the, the, the biggest thing about our education is the fact of having um, our professors also act as our mentors as well, and also that the fact that they came from the professional field is a great help in itself, because there's a lot of questions that we all like to ask of, you know, how do we get into our professional industry? Um, and I'm sure uh, if you were a mentor to somebody, they probably ask you a million questions too. So just having that mentorship, um, and then the fact that the education, as long as they, they take you through the whole basics of everything, of how it's supposed to go and the proper way of doing it. So it definitely helps out a lot to have that as a, as an educational part of the or process of the other, of everything. Yeah, and uh, for me, it was kind of like a pipe dream growing up as a kid, wanting to come to California and make movies and things like that. And I didn't really have any um, any like the resources that I was introduced to when I was going to school at La Sierra. Um, so in that aspect, it helped a ton. Um, and like Vester said, having you know Rodney is one of my mentors and a couple of my other professors who kind of helped me out along the way. Um, is very beneficial. In the minute or so that we have left, what's next for you, gentlemen? Uh, right now, I am in the process of pitching several major projects. Um, and so one of them is an animation, so I'm hoping to do that. And actually, me and Ian are working on a project, but I'll let him talk to him about that more. <laughs> yeah, so the next, the next thing that we're working on together is a movie called Faith. Um, it's, a, it's a Christian film, and it is about a, it's about a girl named Faith who kind of goes through some family, uh, some family drama, and her faith kind of gets put to the test of it, and she meets a group of people who um, invite her to come with them on this journey where her faith will be tested even more, and um, we'll see where that brings her. So. Thanks, both of you, very, very much for your passion for storytelling, for the creativity, the heart, and the soul that you bring to these stories and the stories that are to come. I really look forward to seeing what comes next from each of you. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. At this time, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer and thank God for his blessings. Our God, we are so grateful for the gift of this day, for the gift of the many, many blessings that you give us as we move through our lives and through the stories of our lives. Thank you also, especially this morning, for the gift of story and the understanding that it gives us of ourselves, the understanding that it gives us of our communities, and the platform that it gives us for being able to talk widely with people who are very different than us. Thank you especially for this blessing this morning, and we invite your presence to be with us and to richly bless the offerings and gifts that we bring together as a community. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, amen.
reminded of the incredible power of a story. Stories change people's lives, stories help them address the tough times in life. We're also reminded just before that of a poem by author unknown. Now I remember growing up, my father used to talk about that when he was growing up, he was always surprised at the fact that the most prolific poet in the whole English language was Arthur Unknown. And quite curious how Arthur Unknown had written quite so many poems. Well, of course, we now know that that's a reference to our author unknown. But I think about the fact that when we look at the book of Revelation, one of the great reminders of it in the human story, the human story was not written by author unknown or Arthur Unknown. The human story was written by a known author, and that author is God. And the human story from beginning to end, from its toughest moments to its most glorious, as a wonderful author that we can trust. Last week we looked at the lamb, the lamb who was slain, who was worthy to unseal the scroll of human history and the plan of salvation. Today we pick that theme up and we look at the unsealing of the scroll and the seals themselves. And I've got to admit, at a time in our world when there are so many bad news stories, I wasn't sure I actually wanted to speak to you about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You know, I looked up just the general understanding of the terms, and they, supposed, they are supposed to mean pestilence, war, famine, and death. Now, that would probably be hard to preach as a power of positive thinking sermon or Sabbath school lesson. Wow, that's the pretty heavy stuff. So I spent some time looking more at some of the imagery of Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. I found a variety of paintings that depicted the, the, the imagery. I was thinking of John Gottman, the well-known marital therapist and researcher. He talks about the four horsemen of the apocalypse of marital doom. Not necessarily pleasant. His four horsemen are criticism, stonewalling, defensiveness, and contempt. He calls those the four horsemen of doom for marriages. These are the signs that a marriage is headed for divorce. Now he has some interpretations of those. It doesn't just mean, you know, kind of your everyday criticism, for example. But of John Gottman's four horsemen of the marital apocalypse, anybody know which one is considered really the ultimate fate? Contempt. Do you know what the sign of contempt is? The most common body language sign of contempt is rolled eyeballs. So if you are ever talking to somebody and you notice their eyeballs going like this, you notice they're probably trying to say, I don't trust a thing this person is saying. Back in the days when I used to do marital therapy, I used to notice that with couples sometimes. One person would be talking to me and the other person's eyeballs were just going all over the place. What were they trying to tell me? Don't listen to a thing they say. 
Well, certainly that's one image of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. I was also thinking one, it was speaking of story and filmmaking. A number of years ago, a Hollywood filmmaker who was an agnostic decided to make a movie that tells the story of the second coming of Jesus. Actually, the second coming itself was kind of off screen at the very end, but it, was, it started with a story of a woman who was waiting for the second coming of Jesus. Her friends thought she was crazy. She finally went out to the desert, and there she was waiting for the return of Jesus, and you expect with an agnostic filmmaker that the next part of the movie will show that indeed this woman was all crazy, nothing had happened, she was delusional. The filmmaker decided to do something different, tell a real story about Jesus coming. And so right at the end of the film, right near the end of the film, this woman is looking out at the night sky, the blackness of night, the desert stars all around. I mean, the stars that are so visible in the desert. And all of a sudden, the first horseman, the rider and the horse, starts riding across the sky. And then the second and the third and the fourth. And then the sky fills with clouds and it doesn't actually show Jesus himself. But I remember as I watched that, I was filled with awe because it made it so real. You know how it is with most religious movies. So many of them make the most deep and profound themes of life seem so plastic and artificial. You know, sweet Jesus on a fluffy cloud is what you might expect. But as I was watching those horsemen in the sky, I suddenly got this sense of, what will it be like when this is real? When we are standing here on terra firma and we look and the clouds, the sky unfolds preparing for his entrance. Wow, what's that like when it's gonna be real? So I point out that the book of Revelation is not the story of sweet Jesus on a fluffy cloud, but it's also not vegetarian hellfire. Sometimes people tell stories like the four horsemen and all they can talk about is the gloom, the doom, the unfolding despair. Well, I want to say a little bit about the section of Revelation that we are studying right now. This is what is sometimes called the historical section of Revelation. And we think of it in that way because the first part of Revelation tells the story of partial unfolding of divine judgment. The second part of Revelation tells the story of the full measure of judgment, then finally the ultimate liberation of God's people. So we think about the first part of Revelation using what is called the chiastic structure, the literary structure of the book of Revelation, kind of a stair-step arrangement. And we look at the first part as partial, telling the unfolding of God's story, but the last part, the very end of the story. So the first part spans history. The second part focuses on those parts of history right near the end, and a lot more I could say about that, and why I at least believe that we are safe in saying that there is an element of revelation that deals with the whole expanding story throughout history. You know, so many people talk about first the time in which John was writing. John on Patmos, John during the time of the persecution of Domitian, John looking ahead to some various persecutions of God's people, and then going all the way up to the second coming. Kind of like two parts of an accordion, but I do believe that Revelation also has those expanding billows between the talk about the unfolding picture of God's work within history. I think of a very early Peanuts cartoon when Charlie Brown and Lucy were younger than they were later on. But Lucy is pleading with Charlie Brown to read her a story. And Charlie Brown is very, very reluctant. And finally he said, oh, well, might as well get it over with. So Lucy hands Charlie Brown the book. And Charlie Brown reads it this way, once upon a time, they lived happily ever after. The end. So Lucy is holding the book, and she's looking at Charlie Brown, looks back at the book, looking at Charlie Brown, and she finally says, well, what's on the rest of these pages? Advertising? Well, I wanna say the book of Revelation is dealing with the time of John, the ultimate time of the end, but also what's in between on the rest of the pages. 
I want to say something about you know, the, the, the seal and the scrolls and what we're looking at today. Now, the seals don't actually mean the scroll is unfolded in red. But important documents at that time were sent on, sent and written on uh, papyrus scrolls, and they were sealed with wax seals. Wax seals were placed on the opening to seal up the scroll, and when a scroll was opened, the proper person had to be the one who broke the seals. It had to be done in the presence of witnesses. And so we see in the Revelation, remember who we talked about last week, who was the one who was worthy to unseal the scroll? Jesus Christ, in that, taste, in that section talked about as the lamb. Instead, he was the lion of the tribe of, of Judah, but he was also the lamb who was slain. Well, let's now let's look at the, what happens when the seals are broken. This is not the content of the scroll, as they remind you of that. This is what happens when each seal is broken. Now, the first one, the rider on a white horse. Now, actually, before I talk more about the meaning of that particular horse, I should say a little bit about the imagery of the horses in general, because that's what we're looking at here in this section of Revelation, um, the horses. Anybody remember another point in the Bible where images of four horses are used? Our lesson talks about it. What other book draws on this imagery? I think I heard somebody said Ezekiel. Now, the, um, just reading a little bit, it says, Ezekiel calls them God's four severe judgments. And the lesson actually talks about disciplinary judgments, which God is seeking to awaken his people. Uh, pardon me, actually, I was thinking of Zechariah, because uh, it's both Ezekiel and Zechariah. Zechariah is the one who mentions the colored horses. So there's actually two different books. Uh, in Zechariah, twice mentions colored horses. In the first passage, there are three colors, Red, speckled brown, and white. In the second, there are four teams of horses, red, black, white, and finally dappled or grizzly and bay, pulling chariots. The second set are called the four spirits of heaven going forth and standing in the presence of the Lord and the whole world. And they are described as patrolling the whole earth, the places on which they patrol. So these are some backgrounds, both a reference to Ezekiel, but the horses actually come from Zechariah. And then we find the four horses of Revelation. Now, overall, the theme of the horses could adequately be described as judgment or woe, and that leads us to some difficult debates about the first horse. Now, I won't try to settle all the background, but I was interested in the fact that even our own Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary acknowledges the complexity of the first horse. On one hand, the imagery is very similar to the imagery of Jesus Christ writing that we find in Revelation 19. On the other hand, some of the imagery is very uncharacteristic of the way Jesus is described. Conquest, riding forth to conquer the earth. So there have been a variety of interpretations of this first horse. One is that it really is directly parallel to the, uh, the rider on the white horse in Revelation 19. There's others who have questioned that, saying this has to be like the other horses, that in fact it is a sign of, of, of doom, of judgment. Uh, Billy Graham himself called it the Antichrist. Now, a number of commentators do point out, though, that there are times where Jesus himself is referred to as a warrior. And they point out that this is often looked at as a symbol of the gospel going forth to the world. The gospel going forth to the world that in fact was designed to conquer the forces of evil. So I won't try to settle all of the different aspects of the, the debate about the first horse. But I will say there's enough reason to believe that certainly in the early days of Christendom, there was a sense of hope and optimism and a belief that even though the church of Jesus Christ was a church in exile, a church facing persecution, the church itself had a certain Christ-likeness in the spread of the gospel. So anyway, I'm not going to get into all the details of, of some of the debate about that, but I will point out that there are some reasons to see at least some parallels with Revelation 19. Then we find the second horse. Now that one is somewhat obvious in terms of, of the meaning. It talks about very clearly, it says the second horse is not just red, but fiery red with bloodshed and sword. 
And so in verse 3, it says, When the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. And then another horse came out, a fiery one. Its rider was given the power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. So we mentioned the, the fiery red bloods, uh, blood of the, uh, the warfare there. The third says, when the lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come. And I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in its hand. Then I heard what sounded like a, a voice among four living creatures saying, two pounds of wheat for a day's wages, and six pounds of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. Now, this is clearly a symbol that is framed around the issue of famine. Actually, denarius, the, the word used in most of our, our English translations, um, you know, the, there's an upgrade that was made which actually expresses the British uh, system of, of, of economics. But the denarius, the actual original one, this would have been that a whole day's wages were required for the enough wheat to feed one person for a day. There would be three times as much barley. Barley was cheaper than wheat, but clearly a symbol of famine. And then the last part about the oil and the wine, some people have interpreted that to mean the fact that this was such that it did not impact the things that would have been used by the richer people. It was more of a famine that affected those who were poorer. Once again, I won't get into all the debates about that, but um, I do want to point out that only the black horse and its rider are the ones where we actually hear a voice. Then finally, uh, actually, um, the, the final horse comes along, and that is seen as a symbol of death. It says he's followed, he's followed by Hades, or the resting place of the dead, and is often pictured carrying a sickle. And so the fourth horse is talked about, we sometimes think of the grim reaper. It says the color of death's horse is written as chloros, the original which can mean either a green, greenish yellow, or pale or pallid color. It's one that is often translated as pale, although ashen, pale green and yellowish green are sometimes used. And some of the scholars point out that some of the modern depictions of this horse depict it, depict it as green or else the sickly pallor of a corpse. Wow. So what good can I say about the four horsemen of the apocalypse? What is there encouraging about these horses riding across the night sky? One way or another, they are talking about doom and judgment and some of the most negative and troubling imagery that one might find in all of the Bible. Well, then we go on to the fifth seal, and it doesn't sound much more hopeful. The fifth seal talks about the souls under the altar. Verse 9, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and his testimony that they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants and avenge our blood? How long, O Lord? And I think that's what we can say is the important lesson in all of this. Ties in very well to what Pastor Randy already shared earlier this morning about grace in the midst of our trials. Because one of the most difficult things in human trial, the difficulties, whatever it might be, when those four horsemen are trampling on something in your life, when you are facing illness, when you are facing war, and it might not be big war with guns, it might be domestic war, war with your colleagues. When you are facing famine, famine of one sort or another, shortage, something is not in abundant supply. It can be money, what we talk about, you know, too much month at the end of the money. It can be a shortage of love or relationship or resources at work that will help you get the job done. When you are facing shortage, what then? When you are facing mortality, the giving of the very qualities that give your life vitality, what happens when you're losing your health? What happens when you're staring into the face of your own mortality? What does God have to say? 
Well, I do want to point out the fact that the ultimate answer in Revelation is the most hopeful, positive message you could possibly find. But I also want to focus on the times when we're crying out in despair and saying, how long, O Lord? How long do I have to wait? And God has an answer, but the first answer is not the one we want to hear. It's wait a while. Chapter 8, which also deals with the seals, talks about silence in heaven for half an hour. Silence. Times of God's silence, we don't see the answer we're looking for as quickly as we want. And somehow inside ourselves we're crying, how long, O oh Lord? I want you to trace that cry throughout the pages of Scripture. How often that is the cry of God's people. And just think about how hard it is to wait. I hate waiting. I was joking with a friend of mine. I said, Costco is actually the poor man's Disneyland. You don't get the ride at the end, but at least you get the main feature of Disneyland. You get to wait in a long line. Actually, that's part of Costco's marketing strategy, by the way. They do not have express lines because they want you to know that once you stand in a Costco line, it is worth it. And so what that means is that when you go to Costco, you prepare to stock up. They use huge shopping carts and bulk supplies, but part of the strategy is making you wait in line. It's not like Stater Brothers or wherever you have an express line. Costco doesn't want to give you an express line. Because they know if you wait for something long enough, you'll really value it. And that means that when you go to Costco, you're going to do your best to make sure that it was a valuable experience. You came home with as much loot as you could possibly get. So we become accustomed to standing in line at Costco or Disneyland or places like that. But waiting is difficult. Now, people in this community have to wait for many things. I've been working a lot with medical students this quarter. Medical students had to wait to get the, le- the answer, the letter that would let them know whether they got into medical school. And there are moments of waiting all the way along. I remember watching my students this week, watching them stagger up and down the hallways of Centennial Complex with his dazed and confused look, and I was saying, hey, how's it going? How are midterms going? And a few of them said, not as bad as we thought. But anyway, they, then they have to wait for results. They have to wait for the results of board exams. And then they have to wait for match day. Match day is when you know where you're going to live happily ever after in a residency. And that's a long, excruciating wait for some of our medical students. You know, there's all kinds of things. Where will I get sent? Will it be someplace where there's a polar vortex? Will I get sent the same place as my significant other if they're in a relationship or if they're married? Will it be in the you know, place that I actually want to work? Wait, 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 wait. Agony. So, so exhausting. But you may have faced other cir- circumstances in your life that forced you to wait. You wait for medical results. You struggle with something and you wait to see if you're going to be able to be healed, if it's going to be something that is going to respond well to medical treatment. You don't know. Waiting is one of the most difficult things to do. I know how much I even just hate waiting in traffic jams. You know, I just, uh, you know, some people get used to it. They can become accustomed to it. But when I was going in regularly to Los Angeles to take care of my son after his accident, there was not only the wait to see about the long process of recovery, but every time I drive back, it seemed like I'd get caught in a traffic jam. I'm not good about being patient in those circumstances. And I know that um, the classical station has this anti-road rage melodies at five o'clock on every afternoon for people caught in waiting. What is it that God says in the face of waiting? I'd like to share with you a story, a story from a town that is well known here in Loma Linda, Paradise, a town that has so many parallels with Loma Linda in turn many of our graduates went there. 
But a first responder was talking about the experience, the waiting, the agony. Many people could not get out of paradise. The roads were closed, littered with burned out cars, all paths of escape were closed. And so the first responder describes it this way. To the south was a gun shop called Fins, Feathers, and Sports, stocked with live ammunition. To the northeast, a propane yard. Across the street, a fast strip gas station. And all around, soaring, drought-crisp pines. And in the center, 150 terrified people who had fled the ferocious campfire, only to be stopped in the intersection of Skyway and Clark Road, just forced to sit out the deadliest conflagration in California history. In a parking lot surrounded by fuel, barred from escape by roaring flames and road, roads that were choked first with traffic, then abandoned vehicles, and finally with burned out hulks of charred metal. Are we gonna die, somebody asked over and over again. The job of the fire chief was to keep people from panicking and as calm as possible. And his uh, response to the fire chief each time, no, you're not gonna die. Despite its obvious downsides, he told him the parking lot was the safest place to be on November 8 as flames raced through paradise with astonishing speed, taking authorities and residents by surprise, snarling roads with evacuees, killing 88 people and counting. A series of small decisions made by firefighters got, um, helped gather a, a group of people there in the parking lot. But he said, we had to tell them the one thing nobody wants to hear at a time of disaster. Wait. And then he goes on and describes the experience of waiting, how difficult it was to wait. But ultimately, how much that was the very, very best thing that could happen at that point under those circumstances. I think of Ellen White's own statement, even in the very, you know, the end of the time of Jacob's trouble about waiting, delay being the best answer to the prayers of God's people. Wait. So we're going to leave it on a note of waiting today. Revelation is filled with the good news of what happens at the end of the story. But Revelation also talks about the experience of God's people. In a sense, the souls under the altar where God has to say, wait. Wait for a period of time. I want you to think about your time in your own life where you just have to wait. How hard that is. I read to my medical students a section from a physician, Christine Montrose, who talks about her experience when she celebrates the marvels of modern medicine, but she says sometimes the best thing I can do to heal people is just to abide. And then she goes through all the meanings of the term abide, the history of the term, how it is used of the experience of a physician waiting with people when there is no certainty of a cure and when their experience is just waiting. And then I'll play the song, Abide With Me. Fast falls the even tide. Though darkness linger, Lord with me abide. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless. Oh, abide with me. That's the good news I want to leave with you today. I want to remind you the revelation is full of the great, explosive, cataclysmic, apocalyptic news of the second coming of Jesus and the place we will live in eternity. But revelation is also a word. God's with you when you wait. Let's pray. Lord, abide with us when we wait. When darkness lingers, when other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless, oh, abide with me. May you abide with us today and this week, this month, this year, and forever. In Jesus' name, amen.